morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction. Great to be back this morning. Um, I think what we're looking at um, this first session, um, we're looking at it in terms of continuing to provide the foundation for our very specific thematic focus uh, of the week, which is really looking at uh, legal capacity, independent living. So we're going to continue to sort of lay the foundation. Um, and this is a, a great opportunity for any of you who, who do have questions that pertain to the CRPD in general. We're going to focus on the general obligations of the CRPD, which we hope will allow us to uh, dig deeply into the obligations around legal capacity and independent living um, uh, throughout the course of the week. But this is a great opportunity for anyone to um, to ask questions, raise questions. Um, many of you have, have raised some excellent questions during the coffee breaks and lunch breaks, but uh, we encourage you to do that in the context um, of, of these two sessions this morning as well. Oh, it's, it's doing this tricky thing that um, Jerome is that, and I, 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 I didn't plan it this way. I want it to just flash. But anyway, okay. Um, so uh, outline for this morning's discussion, what are the general obligations of the CRPD? That's what Gerard has tasked us with focusing on. Where do we find these general obligations? What do they mean? And are there tools that we can use to, to discover what they mean? And how might we use them in the context of our work, whether thinking about legal capacity, uh, living in the community, or indeed thinking about applying those principles and interpretive tools to other obligations in the treaty. Uh, so we thought we'd start, start out this morning with, with, again, kind of reviewing what are the structural components of the convention. We did go through that yesterday, but uh, we've got the preamble, which, uh, as Rosemary said yesterday, provides us with the sort of historical antecedents to the convention. Um, and I think she pointed out yesterday, quite, uh, quite rightly, that there are things in that, and there are certain instruments that, are, that were purposefully left out of the preamble. Um, and that kind of gives us an idea of, of you know, the, the extent to which the drafters um, privileged certain documents, like the standard rules, like the Universal Declaration, like the two covenants. Um, and uh, we're not so enthusiastic about other instruments that were, um, in some instances, um, disability-specific instruments, like the two documents um, developed in the 1970s. Um, the two declarations. The two declarations, which are really regarded as quite outmoded and, and not appropriate. Also left out was a reference to the um, MI principles, and I think that's pretty important for our thinking about legal capacity issues this week. Um, these are the, um, I don't know what the full name of the document is, the, the uh, principles on, on mental illness, they were adopted right around the same time as the UN standard rules. That 1991. 1991, uh, very controversial document during the drafting of the treaty, and um, several groups um, lobbied uh, very hard for the exclusion of mention of the MI principles uh, because, again, of the sort of outmoded, antiquated um, uh, perspective of disability reflected in that particular document. Uh, okay, so the preamble has, has <coughs> lots of good stuff in it. Articles of general application we referred to yesterday, um, articles one through nine. Um, we're going to be focusing in particular this morning, um, especially on, uh, on Article 4 that lays out the general obligations. What do state parties need to do in general in order to meet the treaty obligations? The specific standards, the rights and obligations uh, in Articles 10 through 30. Uh, one important thing to note about the structure is that there, there's no categorization of rights in the uh, Articles 10 through 30. So in other words, there's a, a, a mix of civil, political, economic, social, and cultural rights in 10 through 30. They're not um, categorized in terms of civil and political rights, economic, social, and cultural rights. Rosemary's going to talk uh, quite a bit more about that distinction in human rights law and why it's important. Um, but for our purposes, it's just a mix from 10 through 30. Um, we have the full range of, of human rights reflected. 
um, at the beginning of the, the drafting, some of the countries, like my own country, was arguing for a very narrow uh, non-discrimination type uh, treaty that, did not, that would not cover the full range of human rights. Fortunately, that uh, argument did not win the day, and we have um, a, quite a comprehensive treaty, uh, more like the Convention on the Rights of the Child than some of the earlier conventions, like the Women's Convention or the Race Convention. Implementation and facilitation and monitoring measures are in Articles 31 through 40. And we'll hear a lot more about monitoring the CRPD later in the week. And then the final provisions uh, in Articles uh, 41 through 50. All right, so nature and scope of CRPD obligations. Um, they're an integral part of international human rights law. And what uh, the drafters were attempting to do uh, with the CRPD is elaborate human rights in the context of disability. Um, the mantra throughout the drafting process was uh, these are not new rights, they are existing rights. So in other words, we are articulating um, disability uh, rights um, not as new rights, but as part and parcel of the general human rights framework. That which was already there, but not specified in the earlier documents. Now, if you go through and read the CRPD, you'll see that actually there's a lot that looks kind of new, looks kind of different. Um, so perhaps it's something of a fiction that uh, we didn't actually create anything new, but um, uh, clearly it was a very important part of the drafting process and the process to bring states on board uh, to stick with this mantra that no, we're not doing anything new, we're just really saying what's already there implicitly, um, but we're just making it explicit. Uh, human rights and fundamental freedoms are, as we said yesterday, indivisible, interdependent, um, and therefore we need to focus in our discussion of general obligations this morning on implementation, promotion, and protection of civil and political, as well as economic, social, and cultural rights in the CRPD. Rosemary is going to elaborate uh, more on the, the distinction and differenti differentiation of obligations in respect of those, uh, those civil and political rights and economic, social, and cultural rights. As we said yesterday, the CRPD uh, needs to be interpreted in good faith in accordance with the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, Again, taking into account the object and purpose, ordinary meeting, uh, preparatory work of which there's volumes and volumes and volumes, um, nicely archived on the UN website, as well as relevant practice. And we have lots of relevant practice that's emerging, both from the regional systems, European Court of Human Rights, Inter-American Court, um, as well as other treaty bodies and of course um, domestic um, jurisprudence as well in many of the countries. And we'll be hearing about some of the really interesting uh, law reform initiatives that are taking place uh, in different parts of the world with respect to implementing the convention. Did you want to say something, anything about, um, about I don't know, foundations? Uh, we haven't talked much about social model, medical model. Yeah, I'm I do a little bit of that in my session that starts, so I don't know how much we're going to get into it. All right, so moving on and looking at the nature and scope of CRPD obligations, um, we'll get to a more interactive uh, session in, in a minute. Um, but we're going to look to the CRPD text, uh, but we're also going to, as we said yesterday, take into account um, the work of UN bodies and other organizations, special rapporteurs in the field of human rights. We're getting uh, a number of more disability-specific reports of special rapporteurs that attempt to shed light on the interpretation of the CRPD. Um, uh, so all of that is, is really important to take into account when, uh, when we're trying to interpret provisions of the CRPD. Um, some rights recognized are to be attained progressively. <coughs> Rosemary's going to talk more about that. Others um, need to be implemented uh, immediately. Uh, it's not always so easy to disentangle what aspects of rights are to be uh, uh, immediately realized and what 
are to be progressively achieved. It's actually not all that straightforward. NGOs play an important role, of course, in promoting and implementing the CRPD. Um, and Steve Esty spoke about the uh, role of DPOs in particular in drafting the treaty. Um, and I think because of the very strong role of DPOs and disability advocates in the drafting process, uh, we see in this treaty, more than any other human rights treaty, very specific roles accorded to non-governmental organizations in the monitoring and implementation of the treaty, and also, as we'll see in a minute, in the, um, in the actual general obligations of states. So uh, really interesting uh, role for NGOs and DPOs in particular uh, accorded in the treaty. States' parties are accountable both to the international community and their own people for compliance. Um, as we talked about yesterday, the organs monitoring the CRPD need to pay attention to principles laid out in Article 3 and the cross-cutting obligations and assessing compliance. Um, and particular attention should be given to measures to improve uh, the standard of living of the poor and other disadvantaged groups within the disability community. So if you look at the preamble, you'll see various references to particularly marginalized groups within the disability community and other marginalized groups um, that really contribute to multi-dimensional forms of discrimination. So persons living in poverty, uh, persons um, uh, living in areas uh, where there's armed conflict, refugees and IDPs, for example, implicitly referenced in the preamble, uh, and so on, and, and references to indigenous persons as well in the preamble. So turning to Article 4, again, part of the general, um, a part of a cross-cutting obligations uh, at the beginning of the treaty, it's got a dynamic relationship clearly with all other provisions in the treaty, meaning that the obligations in Article 4 uh, need to be implied, applied across the treaty. Uh, and it describes the general nature of the legal obligations, um, the general legal obligations undertaken by states' parties to the CRPD. So very important to think about Article 4 in relation to understanding Article 12 on legal capacity, Article 19 on living independently and in community, as we uh, delve into those more, more deeply during the week. So what are the general obligations set out in Article 4? Article 4 lays out specific requirements for addressing the legal framework. And we are going to spend a lot of time this week talking about the legal framework because of the very specific domestic uh, law reform efforts that, that we're going to uh, talk about, in, particularly in the context of legal capacity. So what are these specific requirements? Adopting legislative, administrative, and other measures modifying or abolishing existing laws, regulations, customs, and practices that constitute discrimination. So again, a strong um, uh, emphasis on disability discrimination. Um, and, and clearly, uh, the CRPD committee, the treaty, et cetera, is, uh, there's a strong focus on, on the development of national disability discrim discrimination laws. When we started drafting the treaty, there were fewer than 50 countries around the world that had any kind of comprehensive disability discrimination legislation in place. Since uh, the, uh, 2006, we have a tremendous uh, amount of law reform going on that's attempting to fill that gap. Um, so we see a lot of countries going in the direction of adopting a disability-specific anti-discrimination law. Now, the troubling troubling thing about that is um, many countries are moving forward very quickly to adopt a disability discrimination law because they've ratified the treaty. So that's a really good thing. The really not so good thing is that um, quickly drafted legislation that does not include, for example, the, the voice of DPOs uh, and is not done in a, in a sort of considered process is likely to fall short of the CRPD. So we see all sorts of draft disability legislation that is supposed to uh, provide um, non-discrimination protection for persons with disabilities, but th these drafts are missing key elements uh, of disability discrimination law. So we see all sorts of drafts without any reference to reasonable accommodation. It's a core element of, of, uh, of the non-discrimination obligation 
in the treaty. So um, there's a, a lot of work to be done uh, on, by all of us to uh, you know, raise awareness about what are the content of the, of the obligations of the CRPD and what are the key elements of, for example, non-discrimination in the CRPD. Um, and then measures to eliminate discrimination on the basis of disability by any person, organization, or private enterprise. Clearly, uh, really important, we're not just talking about measures undertaken by governments, but governments are responsible for ensuring um, that discrimination is eliminated uh, where practiced by uh, private enterprises. Really important for our consideration of um, of Article 19 and independent living. Uh, a number of institutions in many parts of the world uh, are not run by the government. They are run by private companies, um, private organizations in many instances. So governments are responsible for monitoring what goes on in these institutions, hospitals, etc., whether they are uh, owned and operated by the government, or whether they're owned and operated by an NGO, by a private company, and so forth. Okay, so we thought we'd um, throw out a case study um, that looks at Article 4, and um, we're going to share with you the uh, Hungarian initiative that was um, put into place very, very quickly following the adoption uh, of the CRPD in 2006. Um, clearly what Art Article 4 requires is a, is a comprehensive legislative review in order to assess uh, compliance with the CRPD. So one, um, I think, pretty neat advocacy example um, was an initiative by the Hungarian disability community uh, led by a deaf organization there that was working in particular on the recognition of Hungarian sign language um, uh, in, in the national law. Uh, and uh, they worked together in coalition with other disability organizations, um, brought together the Hungarian deaf community for the first time ever, as well as other allies in the disability community. Uh, and they lobbied heavily for recognition of sign language as an official national language. Um, and um, they were working in particular on uh, the references in Article 30, for example, of, um, uh, t of linguistic identity and the protection um, of cultural rights. And they went through a very carefully considered process, working closely with the government of the time. Uh, and I think it, it, it's a really interesting piece of legislation because not only did they adopt um, this legislation that recognizes sign language uh, as, as an official national language um, with various obligations on the part of state to make, um, uh, to make sign language interpretation available and so forth, um, but it also went carefully through um, other bits of Hungarian legislation and amended a number of statutes in order to ensure consistency with the principles and objectives of the act. So, for example, they amended the Code of Civil Proceedings, various statutes on criminal offenses, public notaries, radio and broadcasting, among others, to make sure um, that um, sign language uh, and sign language interpretation would be um, available in, in these other contexts. So it was a, a great example of uh, both participation of DPOs in um, a national legislative uh, reform effort, as well as a very um, carefully done scoping exercise to make sure that the legislation they were actually adopting, um, you know, was was comprehensive enough. So again, looking through all of the legal framework to ascertain what particular um, amendments might be required. Um, in respect of other statutes. Okay, what are the other obligations referenced um, beyond law reform uh, in Article 4? Protection and promotion of the human rights of persons with disabilities in all policies and programs. 
refraining from acts or practices inconsistent with the convention, um, and a number, number of other measures, undertaking and promoting research and development of universally designed goods, services, equipment, and facilities, undertaking and promoting research and development of and promoting the availability and use of new technologies, providing accessible information to persons with disabilities about mobility aids, devices, and assistive technologies, and promoting the training of professionals and staff working with persons with disabilities in rights uh, laid out under the convention. Um, so let's look at state responsibility for violations of the CRPD. Um, a state party will be in violation of the CRPD if it fails to take a step which it is required to take by the CRPD. Sounds, sounds pretty obvious. Um, let's make that a little more concrete. So a state party will be in violation of the CRPD if it fails to take a step which it's required to take by the CRPD. Anyone have an example of a, a specific step required by the CRPD which a state um, must take? Any examples? Reasonable accommodation. What's that? Provision for reasonable accommodation. Okay, provision for reasonable accommodation. Okay. Um, so how would, how would a state be in violation of the CRPD if it, can you make that more specific? Yeah. If the state uh, does not make uh, amendments in the laws. Okay, if it does not include reasonable accommodation as a, um, an element of non-discrimination in its legislation? Absolutely. Okay. Any other ideas? Examples? Yes. Uh, if the state fails to modify laws and their national laws and ensure that they address the concerns of persons with disabilities. Okay, good. If a state fails to modify uh, its laws in compliance with the CRPD. Good. Okay. Um, another example of, of how a state might be in violation of the treaty, if it fails to remove promptly obstacles which it is under a duty to remove to permit the immediate fulfillment of a right. Can someone give me a... Well, just get the room and mics out so we should... Oh, okay. Specific example, we're going to get the mics out so that we have full accessibility here. So, state failing to remove promptly an obstacle which it's under a duty to remove in order to permit the immediate fulfillment of a right. And again, let's make that specific. This is a general obligation. Let's apply it to a, a very specific um, situation. Make a public building accessible to people in wheelchairs. Good. Okay. Absolutely. So, for example, in order to uh, realize um, uh, access to justice or the ability to exercise legal capacity in the context of being able to access a, a court building, that would be a great example if the state fails to do that. So the first um, case coming out of the Equality Court in South Africa actually um, involved a case of a, a woman lawyer uh, who was a wheelchair user who was not able to ac access the courthouse um, because it was not physically accessible and therefore she was not able to actually perform her job as a lawyer. Um, so that's a great example. Yes. Um, I don't want this to be another South African example. So let's just say <laughs> in a country that shall not remain nameless, but <laughs> country X, which, <laughs> which recognizes the presumption of innocence. Um, the the uh, legislation which regulates the registration of voters says that you cannot be registered as a voter if you are of unsound mind, <laughs> or words to that effect. And I can say that that um, applies to many jurisdictions in Africa. Okay, great. So, reform of the electoral code would be in order on ratification of, of the CRPD. So, we're over here. So, uh, I work in Russia right now, and one, um, but part of the legislation that I think should be modified is uh, allowing uh, 
doctors to recommend home study for children um, based on their disability. Um, so if they use a wheelchair, they could be they could be recommended that they study at home, which parents often take as um, as a mandate. <laughs> okay. Instead of uh, making provision for the child to be accommodated in at school. <coughs> Good. Great. <coughs> By failing to provide a convenient parking space or not for vehicles used by a person, you know, a PWD. Okay, so the failure to um, to basically make accessi accessibility provisions. Provide accommodation with yeah. the options for parking. Good, all right, let's um, move on. Um, uh, I, I, oh, I want sorry. to ask one point. Um, yes. My doubt is, uh, suppose a state perpetuates uh, laws which are discriminatory, which, which perpetuate disability-based discrimination, does it not amount to obstacles? Amount to, sorry? Obstacles. Obstacles. Or barriers. Oh, obstacles. Or, yeah, obstacles. Absolutely, absolutely. If, if legislation is in place um, which is discriminatory, that needs to be removed. So inaction on part of state for a long time should we treat at a, should we treat it as an obstacle? Inaction by the state for a long time. Yes, I would. Yes. <laughs> Is he saying inaction? Inaction by inaction. the state. Inaction. Oh, inaction. Yes. Inaction. Yes. 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 Perpetuating yes. the existing discriminatory regime for a long time would certainly amount to inaction. Uh, so should it be treated as an obstacle? Yeah, I mean, we're going to talk in a minute about um, uh, violations by acts of commission or omission. Uh, okay, so state will be in violation of the CRPD if it fails to implement without delay a right which is required by the CRPD to be provided immediately. Yes, Again. Yes, 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 yes. yes. I'm going to ask your question, Janet. Uh, going back a couple of examples around uh, around public buildings and making them accessible and things. So I was in a meeting with some politicians in a, in a province in Canada last year, and they were asking me about that very thing. There's a lot of nervousness when you get into implementation of the convention about these kinds of things. So I appreciate your thinking and some clarification about it. But what I said to them, but the, the politician was the Minister of Justice, and he was asking about courts in Newfoundland, the province where I was at the time, and said, if we go forward and ratify this convention, then do we have to make every courthouse in Newfoundland accessible like that? And I said, that's not my understanding of things. That my understanding is that you can't build inaccessible courthouses from that time forward. And furthermore, that you should put in place a program to retrofit already existing things over a period of time. That's the way that I saw it. But, but from, uh, but what I was hearing you say, or other, that there's sort of an immediate obligation on the part of the state to make public buildings accessible <coughs> upon ratification, and that seems a, a horse of a very different color to you. So I wonder what you think. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Yeah, I mean, what I would say in relation to that is. The immediate right to be realized is, for example, making it possible for a person to cast their ballot or making it possible for a disabled lawyer to do their job in court. So that doesn't necessarily mean that every single court bu building overnight needs to be made accessible, but measures need to be taken to ensure that a person with a disability whether a person using a wheelchair or requiring different means or modes of communication or what have you, or other types of accommodation measures, they do need to be made immediately in order to facilitate access to justice, in order to facilitate uh, access to medical care and procedures and so forth. I mean, immediate realization is, um, I mean, these days, the, the modern understanding of the obligation, and we'll go through this a lot this morning, we'll as well say it. 10 different ways, but essentially 
all rights immediate but realisable to within the extent, maximum extent of resources available. There would be a higher threshold on courthouses um, in terms of the civil and political immediately realisable right for access to justice. So, I mean, what you would do is look at the um, extent of resources that are required to make the courthouses in Nova Scotia acceptable. So your position is saying that what you would need to do is make sure that any new, any new courthouses were completely accessible and that there is targeted, measured um, goals towards retrofitting the other courthouses. And that would be um, you know, an intelligent approach to it and would most probably be the threshold of meeting the obligation. to justice, um, which requires states to ensure effective access to justice um, for persons with disabilities, whether they are witnesses, whether they are um, defendants in a criminal case, whether they are um, plaintiffs in a, in a civil case, um, and so on. Another question? Uh, yes, thank you. <clears throat> Uh, allow me to share the experience from Uganda on egg access to justice and reasonable accommodations with the enhanced awareness around this issue of uh, PWDs. What Ugandan courts are doing now is, of course, the new court structures are being built with the ramps, but the old ones that cannot be renovated to have the ramps and easier access, but court officials are being required to move to the lower, to the ground floor. Okay. And then start off with here in cases of uh, PWDs who come in before the, the judge or magistrate moves to the upper courtrooms to hear the other cases. So really that is to, I think it speaks to adopting any other measures to ensure access to justice and reasonable accommodation for buildings where rocks are not being constructed. No. Thank you. That's a great example. Thank you very much. Yes. 
on the left hand side here and then in the and middle up at the back. Gabriel. <laughs> there yeah. first, yeah. Thank you very much for a mental health sector, so to speak. Uh, did I hear the presenter say that these are not new rights? Just move the mic away from your mouth a little bit. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. For a mental health sector. Yeah, perfect. Uh, did I agree that, uh, did I hear that uh, these rights that we are talking about? Just move the mic away just from keep, your mouth. Yeah. Can I shout? No, 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 just, just <laughs> the mic, just, 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 just not too close to your mouth because it's getting, we're getting interference down here. So you can All keep right. it a few inches from your mouth, yeah. Is it okay? Yes, yeah, perfect. Thank you. I was trying to say, um, I have linked that these rights we are talking about are not new rights per se. They have been with us for some time. Yep. I'm interested in Article 25, making healthcare services as close to the people as possible. But what we are seeing on the ground is one institution, and for that matter, an odd institution that perpetuates human rights violation. You get in there, you see how people are treated, tied to, to doors, sleeping on the floor, without beddings, look at the food. How do I take my government on this responsibility that they have? In fact, for Zambia, they have even ratified and we have a disability act. Implementation problematic. I think that's a great example of why we needed to draft a disability-specific treaty. Because while we could say, in theory, human right, the human rights of persons with disabilities were protected under the you know, mainstream international human rights law framework, um, in reality, disability issues and uh, persecution against persons with disabilities was not addressed uh, at all. Um, so we had the mainstream organizations like Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, um, monitoring and documenting ab abuses against political prisoners who were held in psychiatric hospitals under horrific conditions of the kind that, that you're referencing. Um, and so there's lots of documenting of those types of violations against political prisoners. But the very same conditions and, and um, uh, were being experienced by persons with mental disabilities who were not classified as political prisoners, they were ignored. Okay, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, not, not documenting violations against persons with disabilities unless you were a person uh, labeled as a political prisoner. So, um, great example of, of how in theory, human rights of, of all persons were covered, but certainly not in practice, including in the practice of the mainstream human rights organizations. Um, and in terms of talking about no new rights, um, again, it's, it's for you to decide whether you think the obligations set forth in the CRPD uh, reflect existing human rights, or if you see some of those obligations as representative of uh, a progressive development of human rights law, because again, some of it looks pretty new. Um, that is for you to decide, but certainly the um, mantra during the drafting process was that, oh no, we're not really doing anything uh, super new and different. Don't worry, states, it's, it's okay. Uh, this is all stuff that's implicit, we're just making it explicit uh, in the treaty document. Um, and and I'm, I'm one of the people that actually think it's quite good that we say that this convention doesn't convey any new rights. I think there is value in saying that there is a core framework of human rights that are established by the International Bill of Human Rights. That's the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, the two covenants, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. And the thematic conventions that fall out from those three documents are an amplification in terms of those thematic areas. And what they do is they put them into the context of race, women, children, people with disability, 
um, the other instruments such as migrant workers, enforced disappearances, are a different thematic approach. But what we're saying is that disability is an inherent part of human diversity. And so what are the core human rights apply to people with disabilities? We are not different, we are not other, we don't have new, different, special rights. We have the same rights, we just approach them within a disability context. So I think there's great value in emphasising the fact that there are no new rights in this convention, that it's a translation and an amplification of the existing core human rights that every human being has, but we look at them through the disability prism. <laughs> My God, I said something right for the There's, a, there's a question here first. The first time yeah. ever. Uh, mine is related to the debate of uh, uh, immediate and progressive realization of rights. I will take the example of uh, Ireland with the Disability Act 2005. And this act says that, or says that, all public areas building services should be fully accessible by 2022. And there comes the issue of how we analyze this, the levels of analysis. Are we analyzing it? Because, okay, uh, Ireland has not signed, ratified CRPD, but <coughs> the issue is there is a sh uh, the, the government shown an intention to make accessibility, full accessibility, available in this country by 2022. But does it mean, me as an individual, I cannot assess a building or university or whatever, or a pub, or should I wait until 2022? 20, 20, or I can, uh, um, redress my rights in court because the, the, the building today is not being accessible. In the, not being accessible is a violation of my right to choice or to assess because there is at least two levels of analysis there. Individual, individual rights are also human rights and if I'm affected, I can't go to university just because I live in Galway and the accessible universities in Dublin is a violation of human rights, isn't it? There are two possible ways of answering this. The traditional, the tr traditional application of immediately realisable rights was negative rights. They were the ICCPR rights that were about removing legal obstacles. So there was no resource implication for the country. Basically what the, the community of nations was being asked of each other was to remove <coughs> legal impediments. So you were asking states to nullify, repeal, or modify legislation that identified personal characteristics of certain um, communities within their country and had barriers, legal impediments, to their exercise of rights. So the denial of rights for women that were enshrined in legislation, the denial of rights for minorities within countries. And so there was no economic resource or a resource impact on the country to immediately realise that um, obligation. So all they had to do was remove that legislative framework. Where it gets more tricky is when you start moving into the, the standard of obligation. We'll go into this a little bit further. Of where so if you're respecting your right, it's generally in that terms of removing illegal impediments. When you have to protect that right, you're then establishing a right to a remedy, which is one of the, the, core, the core state obligations that a state holds on to international rights for. So to protect that, you have to establish a mode of um, where individuals can seek redress if there is a violation of that right. That starts to bring in a level of resource impact for the country and because they have to have courts, tribunals, mechanisms for that protection mechanism to happen. And then the fulfilment of a right, which is the third standard state obligation, is about ensuring that all people can exercise 
their rights. And that's where we start moving into a lot more of the economic, social and cultural rights. But increasingly, it's seen within civil and political rights. So to fulfil the right to legal obligations, such as legal capacity, when you're talking about establishing you know, support mechanisms for people to exercise their, their right, when you're talking about the right to life, when you're talking about um, ensuring maternal um, health for mothers to ensure that you know, babies have the opportunity for, to thrive and to develop. Um, so access to those sorts of services have resource implications. And so there's the standard and the threshold of to the maximum extent of resources. So then it's an evaluation of whether the country has repealed legal impediments, made sure that individuals have an opportunity to seek redress if their rights are violated, so their rights are protected, and then whether they are taking concrete, measured steps to reach full compliance. So if a country has a specific plan about making public buildings accessible by a certain date, they have budgetary allocations that demonstrate a commitment to the process, then yes, you would say that they are working towards their obligations. But what you could do, because you hold the individual right, your, your rights are being violated without discrimination, there should be mechanisms where you can seek redress. And there could be a secondary evaluation on whether you're being provided with reasonable accommodation. And so then there's the threshold, again, of disproportionate or undue burden. So, you know, are there the resources to make those facilities accessible? And that, that would be a judicial decision that would happen in the context of all the circumstances of your particular case. Okay. I'm, I, yes, I'm going to move this on a little bit just so we, for time wise. But just on that, I will say that the Disability Act does actually have an internal mechanism where you can ultimately appeal to the Ombudsman. But I should also say that the Disability Act, when it was introduced, did not receive the support of the disability community. Um, it wasn't. It was seen very much as a, if anything, a way to protect national resources against. You know, everything is resource dependent. Everything is about protecting the resource of the state rather than really promoting equality for people with disabilities. So it wouldn't be the, it wouldn't be the guiding light in the Irish legal system. The Equal Status Act might be more appropriate in that regard. But I'm going to maybe move it on and get questions at the end because I'm conscious that we have a long day ahead and this is just the first session. I will have a session time for questions at the very, very end. So if we maybe move it on a little bit, if I can. Well, I think that takes us naturally to um, the obligation set forth in Article 4.3, um, that in the development and implementation of legislation and policies to implement the convention and in other decision-making processes concerning issues relating to persons with disabilities, which in my view would be any legislation or policy, states parties shall closely consult with and actively involve persons with disabilities, including children with disabilities, through their representative uh, organizations. Um, and one of the questions is, what is the relationship to other articles in the CRPD? Well, <coughs> clearly Article 4.3 imposes a, an obligation of consultation um, in respect of, of any of the other substantive articles. Steve Esty yesterday mentioned um, the important role that DPOs played in the negotiation of the treaty and um, some of the other provisions where the participation of, of DPOs um, is referenced. He talked about Article 33.3, um, which relates to national monitoring and the important role um, that DPOs play in the monitoring of the implementation of the CRPD. Um, uh, one of you asked in, in uh, one of the breaks yesterday about the role of, that NGOs might play in shadow reporting uh, or producing alternative reports that uh, provide a little extra information on what a state might be reporting to the CRPD committee, might critique a report, uh, or might fill in the gaps, and we'll, we'll certainly be talking more about monitoring and the role of DPOs in monitoring uh, later this week. 
Um, Oh, look, this is one of the greatest innovations, I think, of this convention. Um, it's really about giving voice to people with disability and the way to formalise it. I mean, um, this formalisation of engagement with civil society, specifically um, people with disability and their representative organisations, disabled persons organisations, I think is a, a really great um, innovation for this convention. Uh, the next slide uh, refers back to the Hungarian process that we talked that I talked about earlier, um, and there's been a number of, of implementation guidelines uh, put out there for helping analyze um, uh, implementation of various articles of the convention. <clears throat> so here's just a, a few of those guidelines by way of example that we might use to assess um, either the Hungarian process or any other. Uh, uh, participation process. Were DPOs actively involved in the development of the legislation or the policy? Was consultation inclusive of the diversity of the disability community? Inclusive of cross-disability representation? Um, that's going to be extremely important. Were DPOs representing children with disabilities involved? <clears throat> Were DPOs led by women with disabilities involved? Obviously getting into questions about the nature of the consultation and was it meaningful? Um, <clears throat> and the issue of representing the diversity of the community is very important. Um, I worked with um, some uh, DPOs uh, from New Zealand who were very concerned about the lack of representation of persons with Down syndrome and families of, of um, children with Down syndrome um, in the formulation of a policy that directly related to people with Down syndrome. And the response they got from the government was, well, we did consult with disability organizations, but they didn't consult with uh, any organization specifically, specifically led by people with Down syndrome or representing people with Down syndrome. Um, and the government finally conceded the point and said, in the review of this policy, uh, we agree that people with Down syndrome actually have to be at the table. Um, so that was a, a great example in that organization, um, very new organization, hadn't been involved in many po law or policy um, uh, advocacy uh, in, in the past. Uh, they used the CRPD and Article 4.3 um, to press their point, and they um, succeeded in, in um, uh, getting to the table. So I thought that was a, a, a super example of, of uh, advocacy around Article 4.3. I mean, the, the really strong thing about Article 4.3 is um, it became very obvious in New York during the drafting process with Ms. H.A. that there was a need of capacity building on both sides, and especially within um, governments. Because people with disability have been isolated um, from mainstream education, from academic opportunities, and so they are representative, are represented in that cohort of you know, policy people, academic, academia, where they engage in the policy discourse. And so there was that void of the understanding of disability. And this was this is a clear way of bringing people to people with disability to the um, the policy discourse, bringing them to the table and giving them a voice. Okay, Article 4.4, long, uh, long provision, nothing in the present convention shall affect any provisions which are more conducive to the realization of the rights of persons with disabilities and which may be contained in the law of a state party or international law in force for that state, and there should be no restriction upon or derogation from any of the human rights and fundamental freedoms recognized or existing in any state party to the present convention pursuant to law, conventions, regulation, or custom, on the pretext that the present convention does not recognize such rights or freedoms, or that it recognizes them uh, to a lesser extent. Um, so what does this mean? It means none of the provisions can be interpreted uh, in such a way to destroy any of the rights or freedoms in the CRPD, um, and that the CRPD is, in Article 4, is intended to be protective of the rights of individuals, rather than permissive of the imposition of limitations by the state. Um, now, one of the arguments uh, put forward by some opponents of ratification of the CRPD in the United States relates to the first part of this article, namely that 
Um, uh, well, this convention is going to actually chip away at existing protections under American disability law. Um, well, that's a uh, clearly a bogus argument uh, if one reads Article 4.4, but that was one of the arguments uh, among many that were silly and, and had no basis. Um, <clears throat> and then secondly, there should be no restrictions upon or derogation from the human rights um, and freedoms recognized in the, um, or existing in, this, in any state party to the convention uh, under other laws or customs, etc. cetera. Um, and that was really important because if you look at, um, for example, the Convention on the Rights of the Child negotiated prior to the CRPD, um, and Article 23 that addresses the rights of children with disabilities, some have read that particular provision um, as actually um, making human rights for children with disabilities a little bit contingent, a little bit lower um, than the rights, uh, the rights of other children. Um, and uh, this particular uh, provision makes clear that, um, that that can't be the case. You can't, um, th this, this convention gives equal protection to all persons with disabilities um, and a state can't point to another law or provision that provides lesser protection. Um, and again, um, looking at some guidelines that have been uh, created for helping to guide implementation of Article 4.4. Um, has a national legislative review been undertaken to ensure that the CRPD will not undercut stronger domestic law? Um, there may certainly be instances where uh, a government's domestic law is potentially stronger than certain provisions in the convention. Um, so that requires a legislative view in, a review in order to, uh, or a scoping exercise in order to determine whether that may be the case. Has there been a review of applicable international law to determine whether it includes stronger protections than those in the CRPD, obviously applicable to, a, to that a particular state that's ratified other treaties? Has there been a review to assess whether any action has been taken that would restrict or derogate from the human rights recognized or existing in a state's legal framework on the basis that the convention does not recognize such rights or freedoms. In other words, is the CRPD being used to undercut human rights protections that exist? So these are all questions to think about and ask in relation to um, the implementation of general obligations. And really important when we start looking at reforms that are taking place uh, around legal capacity. I mean, we would argue that our discrimination, well, our discrimination act has a, a much higher threshold because it has <coughs> unjustifiable hardship as its element of reasonable accommodation as opposed to just disproportionate or undue burden. So we would argue that's a higher threshold and we would um, see that as being the, the threshold that we would keep rather than um, coming down to what we see as a lower threshold with disproportionate or undue burden. Uh, moving on to Article 4 can 5. You, can, you, can you repeat that point? Uh, which particular point? The point that. Just the last, last proposition. The last proposition mm -hmm. that Australia says that says, sees that unjustifiable hardship is a higher threshold? Yeah. Yes, well, um, unjustifiable hardship. <laughs> we believe that um, unjustifiable hardship is a higher threshold for reasonable accommodation. Um, disproportionate burden holds not a lot of jurisprudence behind it, so it's an unknown quantity. Um, where it has been used in the European context, it's been very much a, an arithmetic um, assessment of disproportionate, whereas, or sorry, where disproportionate has been used in um, other jurisdictional contexts, it's been an arithmetic. Um, proposition, whereas unjustifiable hardship is a much broader analysis of the um, elements of hardship. So, and we think unjustifiable um, as a term is a higher threshold than disproportionate. All right, and Article 4.5 uh, talks about um, 
<clears throat> the application of the CRPD to all parts of federal states without limitations or exceptions. Um, some of the ratifying states uh, are federal states, and therefore uh, it needs the, the CRPD applies um, across all parts of federal states. And there's various approaches. I thought Rosemary could talk about the Australian approach. Um, yes, Janet's quite right. The Australian approach is very much a process oriented approach. In 1996, there was significant, um, beginning of significant change in 2006, there was more change. What we did was the process, because the federal, the federal government holds the obligation to international treaties under our um, constitution, yet the states hold um, a lot of the jurisdiction in terms of the implementation of a lot of the obligations of our international treaties. And so there needed to be a process by which there was state engagement with the treaty adoption and implementation process. Um, and what they did was they established a process that allowed for states to be part of the process. And so there's a council of treaties that examines um, the national interest and um, the impact on states. The states have a role through the Council of Australian Government of engaging with all of the international law processes in terms of when there's negotiations going on, they are all consulted about the um, impact on their on their jurisdiction. So it's very much a process orientated approach. It contains um, several elements, both at the federal level, but at that council of Australian government level, they're all the the ministers. Um, the relevant ministers and then the set below <coughs> with all the relevant administrative officers that are involved. Uh, okay, and with respect to the, the US uh, approach. Uh, uh, Canadian <coughs> approach can be so light. Because in India we follow Canadian approach. Um I don't know. I don't know the Canadian approach. Jerome, you're Canadian, Steve, you're Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think in Canada that there's been um, a great deal of consultation, uh, you know, across, I don't know, Steve, if you could speak a little bit to the process of consultation around ratification of the CRPD. Um, he needs a microphone now. Uh, microphone? <laughs> I can. Give me a microphone. In a Cynthia, can we get the microphone over? Can I have the mic down the front, please? Hold it big way. Yep. In here. Is it on? Yes. Uh, in terms of ratification, you know, what happened in Canada is the Canadian government signed the convention. Um, the day it opened for signature in 2008 with 80 other countries. And then what happened is there went, it went into a very internal process between governments at a provincial and federal level. So you have what, I mean, federally each department reviewed their policies and legislation and so forth to make sure they were in compliance and so on. But at the same time, departments of justice across the country in all of the provinces and territory performed a similar process. And there's a, there's a committee of people, it's called the, uh, I forget the name of it, but what it is is a committee of representatives from departments of justice from each jurisdiction. One person from each province and territory and a person from the Federal Department of Justice need to review all human rights treaties, okay? And they, so they talk about all of them. And as part of that committee's agenda, over the course of a three-year period, there were discussions about the CRPD. And once each jurisdiction was able to claim that it was in compliance, 
Then they moved forward. But it was all very internal. There was no discussion with the disability community at all during the course of it. Much to our chagrin, we tried very hard to engage, we tried very hard to discuss and so on, but the government at each level said, you know, this is an internal review process, and we were closed out and simply informed at the end of the day, okay, we feel things are in place and we can move forward to ratification. But it was not transparent at all, and it was extremely frustrating for, for our organization and other disability advocates. That's exactly the same as the Australian approach. I actually would have found it a bit surprising if we didn't probably copy the Canadians. The only difference is, is that the transparency gets a little bit greater once it's been through the Council of Treaties process and it gets back to um, the federal parliament and then there's the national impact um, assessment process and people can um, make public submissions to that process. So there's a little bit of transparency at the federal level in terms of ratification. Great, thank you. Um, I'm being a little cheeky when I'm, I'm referencing the American exceptionalism approach. Um, actually, in signing the convention, which uh, President Obama did in 2009, um, thereafter, a similar, very extensive review process was undertaken across different federal agencies um, and in relation to looking at the laws of various states. Um, in some instances, there isn't federal disability law, but there is state by state law. So, for example, um, guardianship law would be looked at on a sort of state by state basis. So, very long um, and extensive process of review in order to prepare what's called as the ratification package, which then goes to the U.S. Senate um, and assesses in great detail um, the consistency or otherwise of um, American law um, with the obligations um, set forth in the CRPD. And then recommendations are made um, on, on whether certain reservations um, should be made or understandings or declarations in order to ensure that when ratification happens, um, the U.S. is fully compliant with the treaty obligations in question. Um, and we do a strange thing with respect to um, entering a reservation uh, to address the federalism issue. Some would argue that the reservation that um, it contravenes international law, uh, we, I won't get into that. Um, we haven't ratified the treaty yet, but there was a federalism reservation put forward um, to deal with cases where, uh, for example, state law is inconsistent with CRPD obligations. But I think we'll, uh, we, we could talk all day about that. I want to I move on. Um, <clears throat> uh, we were asked to uh, look at some of the analytical tools um, that help us understand um, uh, general obligations of, of human rights treaties um, and that you'll see used by the UN by human rights advocates. Um, so the first one is the very familiar respect, protect, and fulfill framework. Um, and I guess we'll have time maybe to, to work through one, one of these. Um, so respect, the obligation to respect human rights means that states must not interfere with the exercise and enjoyment of the rights of persons with disabilities. The uh, obligation to protect means that the state must prevent violations by non-state actors, such as individuals, businesses, institutions, or other private organizations. And finally, the obligation to fulfill human rights means that states must take positive action to ensure that everyone, including persons with disabilities, can exercise their human rights. So what does this look like? <clears throat> For example, taking the right to life, Article 10, what would the respect, protect, and fulfill uh, framework, what, what, what might it look like, or what, what examples might we fill in? So the obligation to respect, um, with respect to our Article 10, uh, might include um, an obligation that the state does not restrict access to medical care for persons with disabilities. That would be an ex example of an obligation, the obligation to respect. We could think of many other examples that would fall under Article 10. That's one example. Protect, the state takes measures to ensure careful monitoring of all settings where persons with disabilities live or receive services, 
whether publicly or privately operated. So getting back to the example um, that one of our participants provided of um, horrific conditions in psychiatric institutions, that would be uh, an example right there. Um, and the obligation to fulfill. In this context, the state undertakes information campaigns that seek to dispel the myth that persons with disabilities have lives, quote, not worth living, unquote. Um, so again, there are di different levels of obligation. Um, and you can use this framework to kind of sort through um, different types and levels of obligations for, for each right in the treaty. Uh, take another example, right to participate in cultural life and sport, Article 30 of the treaty. Again, the respect, protect, and fulfill framework. We filled that out a little bit. The state repeals discriminatory regulations regarding fire safety, restricting the access of persons using wheelchairs to theaters. So this is an example under particip equal participation in cultural life. Um, uh, fire regulations have often been known to... Um, mm -hmm to discriminate against persons with disabilities, so that would yeah, be an example. Yeah, I will tell you I got kicked out of a lot of sick show in Amsterdam because I was a, <laughs> a fire restriction. <laughs> you know, when in Amsterdam, you do it. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Where'd you go from that? University of students backpacking through Europe. Yeah, okay. <laughs> There you go. All right. Protect. The state requires sign language interpretation to be provided for cultural event open to the public in a private museum. So again, um, the state has a responsibility to ensure um, that private actors uh, respect the right to participate in cultural life. That would be an example. And fulfill. The state adopts a national action plan addressing a comprehensive strategy to make sporting arenas accessible to persons with disabilities as participants and, um, and as spectators. So useful framework, you'll see it time and again in um, documents um, prepared by special rapporteurs, um, in, in analyses used by the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, and by advocacy groups. So uh, generally helpful uh, framework uh, to use that might be helpful as we try to sort through legal capacity, uh, independent living later in the week. Um, so we thought we would work through one. Um, we'll take a civil and political right. We'll take Article 29, one of my favorite articles. Oh. Participation in political and public life. Uh, what would be an example of respecting uh, the obligation to respect the right to participate in political and public life? Again, going back to our framework, requiring states to refrain from interfering with the enjoyment of human rights. Refrain from interfering with the enjoyment of human rights. What would be an Article 29 obligation to respect participation in political and public life? Example? Refraining from interference. Yeah. Yes. Um, maybe. Debbie, just wait for the microphone, it's just, just here. Thanks. Um, two things. One, in response to that, respect to respect, probably uh, the states should put in place measures that ensure free voting uh, rights for persons with disabilities. Like, um, uh, remember the scenario that we saw yesterday, not imposing an legal representative to help the person with disability to vote, but rather enabling this person with disability to freely exercise their right to vote. That way they are, uh, they are respected, uh, the right to participate in public life. But, okay, besides this, there's something I saw on the slide that you did talk about, and I hope you'll get time to talk about. Is it the mass, mass circuit guidelines? The mass street guidelines. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. There's another question at the top here. Okay. Do I say last week? Last week, yeah. To respect uh, yeah. the, this article, currently we should uh, remove all parts of law that require physical ability uh, yeah. to work to fill in a political post. 
Excellent. Yeah. Good. Excellent. Great. So removing legal impediments to um, participating in political parties or political positions. Yeah. Actually, then, what I wanted to say is to, uh, not to impose any restriction on the right itself to elect and be elected by, for example, requiring the sound mind and this kind of basis. <laughs> Right. So, so guaranteeing by law the rights of everyone yeah. to all persons with disabilities to participate in political and public life um, and uh, ensuring non-discrimination in that context would, would be uh, an example. Okay, what about obligation to protect? Requiring states to prevent violations of such rights by third parties. So how would that, what would be an example in the context of um, Participation in political and public life. Okay, I think that just got that. Yeah. Okay. One doubt. Uh, what is the threshold of respect? How to decide? Now, uh, suppose I want to contest election and no political party is ready to give me the ticket to contest the election. Nor, uh, although uh, the law says, I mean, hypothetically, that uh, disability discrimination is prohibited. So what is the threshold? The threshold of respect is that you respect the right. So you do not deny the person the right. So you're respecting their right. But then are you not making a distinction between capacity to hold right and capacity to act? So although you are giving us the capacity to hold right, but you are denying us the capacity to act. But the political party refuses to have more. Sorry, I think I think your your question was that if a political party refused to allow him run for election, does that breach the right to respect? Well, it, it depends on what basis the political party is not giving him a ticket yeah. to run. Mm -hmm. If it's purely on the basis of his disability, that's one thing. If it's because they don't want you as a candidate for some other reason, that's another thing. No, because so, I got a case uh, arose in our jurisdiction recently. Uh, in local and self-government, a uh, few disabled people wanted to uh, contest elections. And uh, no political party gave them ticket. Of course, disability there is discrimination. And then they went to the court uh, asking that we need quotas because government uh, political parties are not ready to give us a ticket. And a very interesting direction came from the Bombay High Court. The direction was that all party, political parties must be asked to read uh, UNCRP and understand uh, the message uh, of UNCRP. Interesting. <laughs> I like that. This is coming from <laughs> Sorry. So, so requiring states to prevent violations of such rights by third parties, I mean, one mechanism would be allow, <laughs> ensuring that political parties respect the right to political participation. But Yeah, I mean, it's... No, uh, uh, to clarify a bit, uh, political parties would argue that, okay, they respect the rights of the disabled to contest the elections, but uh, we want to give tickets to winnable candidates. Candidates who would, would, won, would win the elections. Well, protect would be that there would be an ability for you to demonstrate, say, through without discrimination provisions or any discrimination law, that that, that particular that political party has discriminated against you on the basis of disability. Yes. That's what I was saying. You should be able to challenge that decision. So they, they are in breach of any discrimination laws because on the basis of disability, they have denied you the right to be a candidate for an election. And they, have, yeah. they, they haven't given you candidacy for other reasons. Um, you wouldn't get a vaccine under any discrimination law. And I know that was probably a colloquialism, but it doesn't make sense. Okay. Anyway. There are the state two. would be re re required to um, provide equal access to uh, whatever electoral complaints mechanism they have in place in the state. Yeah. 
There's two more questions over here, and we're, we're now just a little bit over time for coffee. So I'm going to take the two questions over here, mm -hmm. and then maybe we'll, we'll wrap it up for this, for this yep. part. So, Steve, I think you're... Yes. yes. Um, what about a situation, if you're talking about uh, people with disabilities being refused the right to run and so on, one thing. But what about if a political party refused to provide accommodation Say a deaf person wanted to run for a nomination, that when they required sign language interpretation, would a political party be obligated to provide that that form of accommodation in this type of circumstances? It seems like it's a different thing to just deny a person than it is to be compelled to provide accommodation, which is a step beyond in my mind. Well, if that's the step beyond, is that the step between protect and fulfill? Mm -hmm. So is that about fulfilling? the obligation, rather than protecting the obligation. The political party has an, um, an obligation um, not to discriminate against you. And to provide reasonable accommodation. And to provide reasonable accommodation. <laughs> okay, this is the last question over here, and then before break, so. Sorry, no, I just said. We're, we're gonna come back to this after break, so just. Yeah, I mean, yeah. There's, there's so many, um, connections between this and the next session that will basically just be going on and on. Yes. Just actually, um, regarding articles of the mind, uh, uh, with regard to the obligation of political parties, I think the article only imposes obligation on the state. And here it's a technical issue, because the uh, right to, to respect, to protect, and fulfill is not an obligation of the political parties, it's an obligation on the state. And I think we just need to go to the this. Well, the treaties are between the states and the community of nations. So the state holds all obligations. It's the nature of the treaty. That's who signs the treaty. That's who's, who holds the obligation. But they have an obligation to ensure that people are protected from the actions of third parties. Right, so the obligation in this instance would be uh, on the state to ensure that um, uh, third parties or political parties are not discriminating against persons with disabilities. In other words, they have to, the state needs to enforce its non-discrimination law in, in, in the context of political participation, but you're absolutely right in pointing out the obligation yeah. is one of the state states. Um, but third parties are implicated um, in, in terms of the obligation of the state. Um, so I think we'll end it and... Uh, yeah, we'll wrap it up break. just for a break. We will be coming back to this because the second topic is state obligations continued, where we will continue to look at this issue. So save your questions. They're not going to go away, I'm sure, and there will be time. And thanks very much for your participation. It's made this session really, really important.